as I said last time, what I'm going to talk about is really going to be on the evolution of multicellularity. But as you will see, there are good reasons for pretending that it's also about the evolution of social behavior, because the two of them mean the same thing in this context. But the narrow theme I'm addressing is the possible evolution, possible route for the evolution of multicellularity. Uh, I should also say that what I'm going to do here is based on a piece of work, a survey really, a review carried out with Inyaki Ruiz Trio and David Kirk, uh, where we considered three different systems, mine being the cellular slime molds or dictyostelium, you saw the name last time and I'll see it again. Uh, they contributed respectively on uh, what are called the phylasterian, uh, Caprospora, and on the green algae, the volvocalis or volvox and its family. I'll make brief comments about the other two at the end of my talk to show that there is a set of parallel themes running through. Otherwise, my talk will be pretty much restricted to the cellular slime mode. So that's why I call that a case study. Um, not very clear when multicellularity evolved. What we are sure about is that it did evolve in the sense that life on Earth was unicellular for a long time. In fact, uh, consisted of uh, cells without nuclei for a long time. Then you had the evolution of cells with nuclei. And uh, from then on, at some stage, you had the evolution of cells with nuclei grouping themselves into multicellular units. Interestingly, a parallel evolution occurred among non-nucleated organisms, among the ancestors of today's bacteria. And the parallel evolution also led to the evolution of multicellularity, aka social behavior, uh, in a group called the myxobacteria. But I will not deal with that. I'll just mention it briefly. So this talk is going to be concerned with the evolution of multicellularity in uh, ultimately in animal lineage. And uh, as far as the present day animals are concerned, their unicellular ancestry appears to date, uh, going by a whole host of work by paleontologists and uh, uh, climate, uh, people who study paleoclimate and so forth, seems to date back to something like 650 million years ago. And uh, Andrew Knoll, who has done a lot of study on this particular aspect, dates it to the time when the atmospheric oxygen level saw a steep climb. So it's somewhere along the middle of the gradient of rising oxygen concentration, which in turn was probably triggered by an increase in the number of uh, cyanobacteria, blue-green algae in marine, uh, marine water. So that's the time we're thinking of. In general, there are two routes to multicellularity that people talk about. One is a number of things uh, which come together. That's the picture on the, the picture on the left-hand side, aggregative multicellularity. And the other is a picture in which you have one kind of thing which makes many copies of itself which stay in place, which of course is the sort of multicellularity we are most familiar with. Uh, there are modifications on these two very general themes, and we'll uh, probably see a couple of modifications towards the end. But one of the purposes of my talk, and this was prefigured by what Stuart Newman said yesterday, one of the purposes of my talk will be to say that maybe aggregative multicellularity might have been the way through which we got the sort of multicellularity we are more familiar with now which is the division of a fertilized egg today. We'll see whether that can be made to look plausible at all. Right. There are many, you know, in evolutionary biology, especially when you are dealing with macroevolution, with major changes in evolution, you have a whole lot of interrelated themes, and it's not obvious how to factor them out. This is an advantage, uh, this is a disadvantage of thinking of macroevolutionary problems which you don't face generally when dealing with microevolutionary problems where you can look at a single gene or a single protein in controlled conditions, ideally in the lab, and can pose precise questions that you can answer uh, by experimentation. 
So here the two themes are uh, unicellular individual becoming a multicellular individual, which I've already mentioned, and also that of asexual reproduction having given way to sexual reproduction. And the reason these two themes are, both of them of course are enormously big steps taken in evolution. The reason these two themes are intertwined is because the familiar form of multicellular development that we know today is pretty much inextricably tied up with sexual reproduction. So that's what's written there. So you have a multicellular individual, which through this very complex process called meiosis produces some cells with half the, uh, its own genomic complement. And then two such cells with half the genome, genomic complement come together, reconstitute in some way uh, the parental type, though as we know it's not identical to the parent. And then this divides many times and gives you the multicellular individual and you come back again. So the cycle closes, it, uh, closes upon itself. Uh, so this is meiosis, uh, if you wish, and then fertilization, growth, and then of course meiosis in the next generation. The modifications on this theme, and I just mentioned them here because one should be aware of them, not that I'm going to treat them here. You can get parthenogenetic development. So you have multicellular organisms essentially like us, so let's say vertebrates if you wish. Uh, where you have no meiosis at all, but uh, females can give, uh, give birth to essentially the progenitors of what's going to become their daughters. So diploid eggs, if you wish, which are fully capable of uh, developing. You can get budding in certain organisms, uh, followed again by growth and increase in size. And uh, budding is also sometimes accompanied in these systems by fusion, where two small buds get together. And then finally, you can get propagules made by the multicellular individual, technically uh, different from budding, but in principle the same. So some part of the multicellular individual that separates, and in this case, we are thinking of a single cell separating, and that part which separates, now dividing many times and so forth, and the multicellular individual being regenerated by aggregation. So this, this is the theme that we are going to try and follow. What's interesting is that you can get combinations of these circumstances occurring uh, in the same group and sometimes even in the same kind of organism depending on the environment and so on. Yeah. Why this interest in aggregative multicellularity? Well, it turns out that if you look at uh, the best available phylogenetic tree today based on uh, 18S, RNA sequencing, deep sequencing, uh, you end up with these large groups, which are now called supergroups of eukaryotes. So these are these seem to be the largest subdivisions into which all eukaryotes fall. And they're the ophistocons, excavates, archiplastids, which are the ancestors of the green algae and the, and the plants of today, alveolates, staminopies, rhizaria, and amoebozoa. So there are <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven such supergroups. Turns out that except for the archaeoplastids, each of these supergroups contains members today in which you get aggregative multicellularity. So this is something which has arisen independently in evolution in at least seven of these different lineages. And because of how ancient this phenomenon is, we think that it may well have arisen at roughly, uh, at roughly the same time. The archaeoplastids, so the, so the uh, group which comprises the green algae and the plants, is going to be represented in today's talk by the Volvox family, as I mentioned. And there, it's clearly a form of colonial multicellularity that you get, uh, this cell dividing into many cells and forming a group thereby. But interestingly, there are circumstances in which uh, a member of this group, in fact, the sometimes the most primitive member of this uh, group, the uh, cell called Chlamydomonas, also shows aggregative multicellularity under certain circumstances, which may or may not be natural, but it's interesting that it does so. So this is something which cells, and it's going to be a theme of my talk, cells seem to be predisposed to doing if given the right condition. So this is, uh, again, the same kind of that you saw previously, but this time to illustrate that in each of these separate major branches, you've got single cells 
coming together and not only do they come together under certain circumstances, they finally end up building what looks like the same sort of multicellular body or differentiated structure from its rough resemblance to the fungal fruiting body. We saw this uh, yesterday. This is also called a fruiting body. So all of them form fruiting bodies. And the common characteristic of these fruiting bodies is that uh, they rise above the soil. So these are generally found in the soil. Uh, by the way, also an animal dung, that's a common rich source for a great many of these organisms. But if you find them in the soil, they rise above the soil. The typical height here uh, by microorganism standards is impressive, about a millimeter, can go up to two or three millimeters. And right on top, what you see in some cases is a ball, is a mass of these units which have come together, but which have sporulated. And the reason they have sporulated is because this entire business of coming together in these cases is initiated by starvation. So they are starved, they are no longer, longer able to find food, then they come together and build these multicellular bodies. Below those spores, you have what looks again like a stalk of a yeast or some other fungal fruiting body. This is also called a stalk. The nature of the stalk varies, and that's going to be something I'll mention presently. In some cases, it's a cellular substance. In other cases, it's not. When I say cellular substance, I mean it consists of cells. In other cases, it's not. And when it consists of cells, in some cases, the cells are dead. I mentioned this yesterday again, showing a clear-cut division of labor. And in other cases, the cells are viable, showing division of labor without reproductive division of labor, meaning all cells can, in principle, reproduce in the next generation, uh, as the spores do. Uh, but the stock cells being closer to the ground are presumed to be less effective at reproducing than the spores. And the reason for that is the following. Uh, this is a long-held belief and probably true, which is that the evolutionary basis behind the success of this lifestyle is that if you are very tiny, and if you are starved, what you want to do more than anything else is to get away from here to some other place. And therefore, rising above the soil offers you a good chance of passively dispersing. Any passing uh, insect, which is usually hairy or a nematode worm, uh, which is going past, can either entrap you within its hairs, totally unintentionally. Nematodes, it turns out, can also eat these things. But once they are spores, they are unable to digest them. So deposit them later wherever they go, you know, or by pure chance get some of the spores sticking somewhere. And then something rather curious uh, can also happen, which is that if this is a grassy patch, uh, it can be grazed by a whole host of animals. And then a great many of these creatures can get churned up inside the stomach of, uh, let's say, a ruminant uh, which is going around there, uh, or even any other uh, herbivore. And then when it passes dung, it can be laid down as spores once again somewhere else, because the spores once again are not digestible. So it's, it's a rather curious kind of thing. And it turns out also that in addition to insects and worms and herbivores, carnivores can also act as agents of dispersal. Uh, so a student here uh, working with me discovered that uh, these things are quite common also in the dung of a tiger and a leopard. Uh, and there the guess is some of the cats, of course, also uh, can graze occasionally, it's known. Uh, but in addition, it's possible that via eating meat, they get hold of uh, eating the meat of herbivores, they get hold of some of these. In any case, so this is a tactic for dispersal, which seems to work rather well and uh, has served uh, in the future. So comparative similarity. Again, the same sketch as before to show you four examples. Uh, and there are uh, three major groups illustrated here, the supergroups, the amoebozoa, the excavata, and the ophistoconta. And in all of them, you see roughly similar morphology following starvation, amoeboid cells in every case, important point, coming together and building this fruiting body. And then various things happen, as I said, in the, in the so there are two problems here uh, that confront us when we look at the system. I mean, you could call them an engineering problem and a biological problem. The engineering problem is how do these cells come together and build this three-dimensional structure? So it's a kind of 
mechanical engineering comes civil engineering problem. The biological problem is what patterns of gene expression perhaps are implemented by these organisms so that this end point results in a stable division of labor in one way or the other. In other words, what makes them cooperate in the way they do by uh, coming together and building this system body. Uh, there are two broad answers to this question and we've been listening to these for the last two days now. One is that in some sense, each of these forms of development is a special purpose solution to the common problem of living in the soil and requiring dispersal. So that each step in this detailed life cycle that you see has evolved by incremental genetic change followed by natural selection in case the change was advantageous and gradually step by step by step you had this pattern building up and then of course over a larger time scale uh, you could get uh, in the phrase used by Darwin descent with modification maybe slight variations and we'll see that variations are also common in this thing. The second point of view of course which we've been exploring here in this class is that in some way the kinds of generation of shape and form that you see here are a consequence of pre-existing physical and chemical properties that these units possessed before they became multicellular, in other words before the evolution of multicellularity. Uh, following the onset of multicellularity which was triggered perhaps by an environmental trigger or even by things like population density, viscosity of the medium and so on. Following that natural selection acted after the change had occurred to stabilize the change. So these are two uh, at least conceptually distinct points of view and perhaps there are elements of both. Must be kept in mind of course that what we are seeing now uh, is after these 650 million years have passed or 500 odd million years have passed. So you can be pretty sure that whatever you find in present day living organisms uh, must have been the consequence of a great deal of evolutionary change after those 500 million. So in some way we are trying to take a take an eraser and rub out this change and try to see whether we can guess what uh, what had happened at the beginning. Okay, so let me very quickly take you through this dictyostelium uh, life cycle. This is a series of films by K. Inoue and this depends on luck maybe. What that's supposed to be is an amoeba emerging out of a spore. So that's the conventional beginning of the life cycle. And these are amoebae moving around, feeding on bacteria and dividing by mitosis. So this is the growth and cell division phase. When that is completed and they begin starving, they communicate to each other via these really rather pretty oscillatory wave propagations which um, I think I mentioned briefly last time uh, and after the period of wave propagation is well underway they also begin active movements towards common collection points so this is aggregation. After aggregation the entire mass falls to the ground and begins migrating and what it does actually is not to migrate on the soil but to migrate through the soil until it reaches the surface and having reached the surface it goes through this final step uh, which is to arise on top of the soil. So this is a rather nice example of uh, self-organization within a bunch of communicating cells. So the theme is by studying this process in detail we might be able to uncover something of uh, what had happened in the past and let's see, let's see if that goes. So this is simply a repetition of what we saw earlier with an added uh, thing below to show that there is a non-obligatory sexual phase in all of this and one big unanswered question is uh, can one ignore the sexual phase which is what one does usually when talking about the life cycle or does it in some way play an essential role? in features of the life cycle. Okay, so come again. Oh, 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 oh. That happens under what to us working in the lab is a set of very strange conditions, extreme conditions, which is the case by the way with most microorganisms. Uh, so in this case, you have to have very intense light 
flood your petri dish with water uh, and then pray. And then sometimes these cells form zygotes, which is what are called macrocytes. It doesn't fit there. So the usual life cycle is completely, what we think of as a usual life cycle is completely inferred. Right. So there are ways in which one can study this coming together, the aggregative part. Uh, there are people who uh, have built and worked on mathematical models of this. And broadly, the models fall in two categories. There are so-called continuum models, which are similar to the Turing reaction diffusion uh, kinds of models that Newman talked about, except that here you have cells or amoebae. So it's their concentration, if you wish, or their local de <coughs> density that's represented there. And then you have an attractive chemical, a chemoattractant made and released by the cells themselves. It's their concentration that's being, uh, whose rate of change is being monitored here in the second equation. And the broad principle of the equation says the amoebae can diffuse, so that's a diffusion term. And in addition, they can move up chemical gradients, attractant gradients, which is why you have a negative term there. The chemical itself can diffuse, of course, ordinary diffusion. In addition, it can be produced by these cells, so that's a production term, and it can be degraded by these cells, there's a degradation term. So the uh, underlying system is very simple. What is interesting is that it gives rise to a fair amount of complexity, which resembles what you see in the real system. Uh, equally interestingly, there are some things that it does not give rise to, and one of the most important things, at least within the scope of this simple two component model, it does not give rise to the oscillations that we saw a bit earlier. Remember these periodicities that were shown both by wave propagation and during aggregation. That cannot be mimicked by this model. However, the oscillations result quite well when you look at a discrete model, which is a single cell model, because here you begin by modeling the oscillator itself within a single cell, and this was really pioneered by Albert Goldbaker, who you will listen to later, and the model here is really extremely simple. The signal in the simplest case we know is this molecule called cyclic AMP. It's made inside the cell from what's called ATP. And uh, that's uh, well uh, representation of the enzyme that makes it an adenyl cyclase. Cyclic AMP, which is the chemoattractant, goes out from the cells. And interestingly, there's a positive feedback element here. Cyclic AMP, having gone out, can bind to a receptor. That's a second uh, different molecule outside the cell. And binding to the receptor activates cyclase. So you see this positive feedback loop there. Right? And if that loop, which of course by itself would lead to an explosion, if that loop can be shut off by something or the other, and there are any number of things you can do that, including enzymes, enzyme desensitization, and so forth, uh, then you can see that the cyclic AMP levels will shoot up, crash down, shoot up, crash down, and you get a natural periodicity which gives rise to the oscillation. Now you can combine that. So in a combined uh, kind of model, and I think Stuart Newman used the word morphodynamic. So you can build a morphodynamic model in which you get oscillations and wave propagation and cells coming together. So this can be done rather satisfactorily. And, uh, and you can, sorry, and you can show, uh, we'll come to the three-dimensional shape a while later, you can show that these things having come together can build a multicellular mass, right, which is there. So you're there at least uh, at the first part, uh, first part of what you wanted to do. So what have you done so far? You've shown that if you have cellular units uh, which are able to stick to each other in some way, which are able to signal to each other, and which move by ordinary, or ordinary amoeboid uh, movement, then they are capable of coming together, forming one mass. And the reason to, they do that is because whenever there are local concentration fluctuations of these cells, the fluctuations build upon themselves. And the reason why they build upon themselves, uh, you saw in the previous uh, two slides, there are positive feedbacks, A, due to chemotaxis, and B, due to this oscillatory loop, which strengthens the signal going here. Right. Having, having, come, whoops, having come together, this is the mass that they build, which keeps migrating. This is called the slug. You saw that a while ago. This is the final structure that they build, which is called the fruiting body. Now, something rather nice you can show is that precisely as in higher animals, there are other nice coordinated spatial and temporal patterns of gene expression, which you can see in the slug, which mirror what those amoebae do when they form the fruiting body. And this shading here shows you what they do. So the amoebae in the back of the slug form the spores eventually, 
the maybe in the front of the slug give rise to the stalk eventually and because at least in this particular species you have reproductive division of labor namely the spores can reproduce whereas the stalk consists of dead cells the analogy has been made to the germline and soma of a multicellular organism the germ germline being capable of reproduction and the soma uh, not reproducing and the argument has been made that this whole business of coming together including the seeming self sacrifice of the stalk because these are dead amoebae remember this whole thing coming together makes sense because all the cells here are clonally related to each other they are members of the same clone so this so called altruistic behavior of the cells that sacrifice themselves can be explained by saying that they are helping the reproduction of the remaining cells which are spores which have their own genes so this is the verbal argument given for why these cells come together behave collectively and exhibit division of labor through which some of them are advantaged and others are disadvantaged because the argument is that the disadvantage is only apparent at the genetic level they are as advantaged as anyone else having the same genes but it must be remembered that all of these conclusions were carried out in the lab and uh, this was done by microbiologists continues to be done by microbiologists and one of the articles of faith in microbiology is that you work with pure cultures you don't like contaminants so the first thing you do almost before you doing beginning an experiment is to do a subclone and then work with that subclone so intentionally these experiments were done with clonal cultures unintentionally they led to one thinking that that may have been a factor behind this sort of behavior there were other reasons too which i will which i will come to later now there are a number of things which complicate this simple minded picture or make it more interesting depending on your point of view one of them is that cells are heterogeneous and this heterogeneity is a spontaneous heterogeneity which arises in a cell mass so this is an experiment in which you have a mass of cells in this case all members of the same clone whose calcium levels are being monitored and you can see clearly that the calcium levels follow a bimodal distribution there are some cells with a lot of calcium and other cells with little calcium clearly two different modes turns out if you put these cells together after secondarily labeling them the cells which had a lot of calcium end up in the front of the slug these are the same pictures by the way bright field and fluorescence whereas the cells which had very little calcium end up at the back of the slug and we've already seen from the fate map that we saw a while earlier that these are the cells that are fated to die these are the cells that are fated to form spores so you see immediately that even before the cells come together this is at this single cell stage even before they come together there is some sign in these cells of what their future fate is likely to be uh, it's unlikely to be a one to one correspondent but you can certainly certainly see that there are biases in what they are going to do so what this tells us is that heterogeneity between cells are a strong factor in deciding on what happens later and these are heterogeneities of phenotype present in a common genotype so you can imagine that if genotypes also varied to begin with if these were not members of the same clone the heterogeneities would get accentuated would get sharpened now once you put these heterogeneities together in other words assume that your starting population is not uniform you can carry on with the same game that i showed you a while earlier and this is a whole series of uh, whole series of uh, simulations carried out by pauline hochberg and her students and uh, you can in fact get very impressive looking uh, three dimensional masses too so you can model the entire life cycle based only on the assumption that you have amoeboid units capable of movement capable of sticking capable of uh, you know attracting each other because of these chemotactic gradients and then because of heterogeneities in precisely the properties that i mentioned so for example heterogeneities in adhesiveness would make them sort out and give you some cells which are shown here as green some as red some as blue dark blue and light blue and i go back again to the slide which was shown by stuart newman yesterday sorting out of cells in his case he used surface tension in this model it, adhesiveness was used as a parameter you can use surface tension as well it's been done so broadly speaking this heterogeneous mass of cells given these elementary properties can recapitulate at least the interesting morphogenetic features of the life cycle yeah please 
Yeah. So the question is, when they move, are the cells which are going to form the stalk later and die, are they the ones in the front and are the others in the back? Yeah, the answer is yes. Okay. So you have so far uh, differences in properties between single cells, which at least in a, in a rough way can correspond uh, to what you see in terms of the development of form. Now it turns out that you can also ask whether interactions between cells are important for this purpose. And uh, for, this, uh, for answering this question, some years ago, Ashok Bhogle used a rather interesting parameter. And the parameter was the relative proportion of stocks to spores. You remember we talked a little bit about allometry yesterday. This particular ratio, the proportion of stock to spores, seems to be isometric. In other words, it scales with the total number of cells. And in fact, it scales over an amazing range of total numbers over four or five decades of cell numbers, which means going anywhere from about 10 cells, even though that's pushing it, certainly 100 cells, to about 10 to the 7 cells. You get a constant proportioning of stock and spore. Therefore, as a parameter in itself, this is not very useful to distinguish between models because all models are tailor-made to make sure that you get constant proportioning. But you can play with this system by going down in the total number of cells that you have and going down to, a, if you can, a handful of cells. In these experiments, 20 odd was the starting number. And when the numbers are so small, it turns out that you get detectable fluctuations. So these are a measure of uh, what's called developmental noise. And you can use these fluctuations, which are measurable, quantifiable, as a discriminating tool to distinguish between models you can construct a whole lot of models of cell-cell interactions in which the ratio of cell types, the mean ratio of cell types remains constant. So in some sense, the signal remains constant. But depending on the details of the model, the variation about this mean, what you might call the noise in the signal, varies. And use that to discriminate between models. And it turns out, so these are the actual data here. And these are three kinds of models, a purely stochastic model, a stochastic model with size sensing incorporated, with many other things incorporated, switching and feedback. And it turns out that this sort of thing, you can even see this very roughly by eye, this sort of thing fits the actual data much better than anything else. By the way, I should tell you what the data is. I forgot to do that. On the x-axis, you have the total number of cells. And I've told you it varies from whatever, 100 to 10 to the 7 easily. But here the range is only from about uh, 20 to 100, 20 to 120. So you're in the small number range. And the y-axis is the proportion that we want to measure, which is the relative number of spore cells to the total number of cells. And that actually flattens out here at something like 80%. So this curve, which rises from here, goes to 80% and becomes flat there forever. So 10 to the 7 is somewhere there outside the room. Okay, but it's this region that we are looking at now. And here you can discriminate between models. And it turns out now that the models which allow you to fit this data best are the ones in which you have the following thing. So I'll just come to the final model, the most successful model. You have an amoeba. The amoeba is able to spontaneously differentiate either in the spore direction or in the stock direction. And our best guess at this time is that this is a purely stochastic process. So there's something within the, within the amoeba which does this. We have correlates of whatever might be behind this stochastic process. And the calcium level, as I showed you a while ago, would be one of those correlates. But these tendencies, spontaneous tendencies to form spore or stalk, are overlain by other factors. Among them, trans determination. So there's a spontaneous probability that a spore-like cell, or a pre-spore cell, as we call it, could become a pre-stalk cell. A spontaneous tendency for a pre stock cell to form a pre spore cell. And on top of that, there are strong negative feedbacks from this to this transition and from that to this transition. So those are the thick uh, arrows with the bars, thick lines with the bars at the end. So you have a rather complex process here, which best fits not just the mean outcome of patterning, at least this aspect of patterning, which is the proportioning problem, but also fits the variations that we get in this mean, and the variations are visible only when you are at very small numbers. And this complicated model involves A, cell heterogeneities, 
which are reflected in these stochastic probabilities of becoming a spore or a stalk. B, interconversion of cell types before they are fully differentiated. C, negative feedbacks which stabilize cell types when they are differentiated. And D, size sensing, which is shown by the fact that this thing ultimately saturates at 80%, but begins from a very small number. So the problem in a sense for developmental biology or developmental genetics is first of all to see whether these things add up and secondly to see what the molecular underpinnings of these steps are. And we have gone some way in this direction, though I'm not going to discuss any of that now. It appears as if this is a reasonably robust model to, uh, to uh, fit the overall picture. Okay. Now coming back to the situation that we really want to describe which is what's happening in nature. Now things get even more complicated here. Because here it turns out that what we called um, uh, stochasticity in terms of a single cell taking a decision to become a spore-like or a stalk-like cell, uh, this uncertainty, if you wish, in decision making uh, is built upon many other layers of uncertainty. So for example, I've already said that when these amoebae starve, they come together. It turns out that that's not strictly true, and this was shown by Daria Dubravchik in Clement Isaac's lab some years ago. Turns out that there's heterogeneity here as well. There are some amoebae which, so to speak, seem to prefer to take the risk of not joining other amoebae, remaining single, presumably so that if food reappears soon, however, you know, uh, then they're ready to feed and again uh, get going. So they gain an advantage, presumably, over the rest. Whereas the bulk of them do come together. So there's an uncertainty there here. So when food runs out, I've told you that they aggregate, but many of them can remain as an amoeba, not join the aggregate. Some of them, in fact, can differentiate to form a small cyst-like structure called a microcyst. And this is very common with soil microorganisms, especially other soil amoebae, which are not uh, uh, part of this at all. Uh, they insist themselves. So this can wait out starvation, but as a solitary cell. Uh, if they aggregate, of course, yeah, uh, I've already said that there can be different, there can be a sexual cycle which have completely ignored. On the other hand, the asexual cycle, you can get this slug, you can get fruiting body. Excuse me, sir. Sir? Yeah. Uh, so the amoebae which forms the fruiting body, are they heterogeneous or homogeneous? Well, as I said, uh, in the lab, they can be genetically homogeneous, but phenotypically they're heterogeneous. In nature, as I'll tell you in a moment, they're genetically heterogeneous and also phenotypically heterogeneous. One point to which I want to direct your attention is that the probability of a cell dying through all of this, through all of these alternative life cycle strategies, if you wish, that probability can vary a lot. So in case food runs out and an amoeba remains a single amoeba, then you have a variable time dependent probability of death. We can't quantify this because we don't know what the chances are in nature that food will recover. On the other hand, if it becomes a microcyst, then presumably the probability of survival in the long run is pretty high because it has insisted itself, it's resistant to the environment. But how high it is, we don't know. And we don't know because people don't work much with microcysts, how the microcyst itself degrades with time. So this we don't know. The sexual cycle is rather interesting, and it, this throws up once again this paradox which is at the heart of the evolution of sex, which we are not discussing here, which is that the sexual cycle is an enormously costly exercise. People commonly talk about what's called the twofold cost of sex, which is really a twofold cost of meiosis, the cost of the reduction division, uh, the size of the genome reduces by half. But here, the cost can be as high as 99%. Even though this is a different kind of, uh, completely different kind of system. And the reason it can be 99%, and I didn't mention this before, is that the sexual cycle also begins with aggregation, but under these weird conditions that I told you, which are the ones we know, we don't know what's going on in soil, uh, high intensity light, extremely high water tension, and so on. They form these zygote like structures called the macrocyst. Now, in the macrocyst, something, stays, something uh, strange happens because the macrocyst turns out to be one of the large number of, uh, I beg your pardon, the zygote turns out to be one in the large number of cells comprising the macrocyst. Remember, they've aggregated, and uh, maybe up to 100,000 cells have aggregated. But this zygotic cell now turns cannibalistic and eats up the remaining 
whatever 10 to the 7 minus 1 cells. So the, uh, the probability of cell death is huge. So the only surviving cell from this process now is uh, this uh, zygote, only cell which survives within the macrocyst is the zygote. And then of course it undergoes a second reduction division and there may be emerge again. So the probability of cell death is extremely high, death, enormously high. In this case, which is a case that we are, one sec, in the, this case, is, which is a case that we are looking at, the probability of cell death is variable. A while ago, I told you that 80% was a proportion of spores, in which case the probability of cell death would be 20%. Uh, but it can vary depending on the species. It can go up to 50% in our experience. So the only point I want to get across is that uh, cell death occurs as a byproduct of each one of these processes to varying extents. In some cases, we can quantify how much. In other cases, we cannot quantify, but say that it probably is likely to occur. Therefore, the probability of dying, and in some cases, a very high probability of dying, is something that the individual cell must take into account as becoming part of this whole game. So there must be something in natural conditions which permits in the long run this sort of life cycle strategy to persist, to be maintained, in spite of presumably a very high to moderately high probability of cell death. Please keep that one. Yes, please. A multicellular thing, right? Because that could be another example of a multicellular. It is, it is a multicellular thing to begin with, as I said there, because the cells have aggregated. Ah. So those million odd cells are all there. But under these strange conditions, one of them differentiates into a zygote. It actually happens by cell fusion, as you can guess. Because, you know, so this two haploid cells fuse. So it's a strange kind of zygote, uh, meaning that you don't have differentiated germ cells. That zygote is within this thing called the macrocyst, right? And it's there, it's a the, everything is dormant. But when the time comes for it to emerge, the zygote turns cannibalistic. So it becomes, it's roughly twice as big as the other amoeba there because it's deployed and eats up all the rest, then goes through a meiotic division and comes out. Now we have, please remember we are thinking of what's happening in nature and trying to see whether we can fit in our uh, ideas to this. The first thing to keep in mind, and uh, most of what I'm going to say now comes from a whole series of very interesting genomic analysis studies, which have come up with uh, molecular phylogenies, carried out by Maria Romilaro, uh, Pauline Schaaf, Gernot Glöckner, uh, and a number of others working with them. And the broad summary of these phylogenies, which we believe are objective phylogenies, and I must say that this is a strong assumption that we make, meaning that they actually trace lines of uh, descent. The broad conclusion from these phylogenies is that what we thought of as relatedness, what we thought of as likely ancestor-descendant relationships based on similarities and differences in morphology, and what we thought of as a transition from something which was simple to something more complex, the assumption being that something simple arose far back in evolution and something complex was an evolved trait, all of these concepts go out of the window. And in fact, as I'll tell you presently, the same thing has happened with uh, these studies on the phylasterians, the same thing has happened with this study on the Volvocalis. So molecular phylogenies have completely upended, uh, upended simple-minded uh, pictures of how evolution works by gradual modification from something which is elementary to something which is more and more complex. Right, so that, that's the summary of uh, what I'm going to now. On top of that, there are many other things. So one of them being uh, many of these morphologies, so these are fruiting body morphologies, as I told you last time, are facultative, which means that they are condition dependent. In particular, the transition between this and this, as I said yesterday, uh, so this is a large size fruiting body, this is a small size fruiting body, and you can immediately see that cell size is one element in this difference, but that's an obvious and fairly trivial uh, difference. The more interesting difference is that in this large size fruiting body, you have division of labor, these stock cells are all dead amoebae, the spore cells of course are alive, 
in this small size fruiting body you have no division of labor you have only spore cells and the stalk is an extracellular exudate so this is rather interesting in a small size if you wish all cells do something in the beginning and then all cells ending up doing the same thing later so you have changes in the pattern of behavior of cells as a function of time here in addition you have changes in the pattern of behavior of cells as a function of space and this is a theme which will recur during what i'm going to say now which is that in elementary organisms or unicellular organisms you can get patterns of temporal differentiation different things are done by the same cell at different times in multicellular units composed multicellular groups composed of units of the same kinds of things different cells can do different things at the same time so it looks as if this temporal derangement uh, polychrony if you wish is an important element here but the main point about this slide is that the morphologies quite obviously are not intimately tied to the genotype because they can vary in this facultative size secondly in nature it turns out that these cellular slime mold groups are often polyclonal you can also find clonal groups but you can also equally often maybe more often find polyclonal groups and in a way that's understandable especially if these ruminants and grazers are agents of uh, indirect agents of spread because as i said they graze a large area of uh, land crop a large area of land and everything gets mixed up in their uh, stomach and finally gets deposited as a mix there's no way of segregating different units these heterogeneous genetically heterogeneous strains that you find coexisting in nature quite often you find them coexisting on the same speck of soil by which i mean the smallest piece of mud that you can pick up from soil and you can very often not just get different strains of a species from these soils you can get different species and indeed different families as well so there's a huge amount of microbial uh, microbial diversity right there which you can see very easily with your eye uh, coexisting within a spatial area which is small enough for all of them to be talking to each other that's fairly obvious because the spatial dimensions here are probably of the order of a millimeter or half a millimeter not uh, maybe 100 microns 1/10 to a millimeter so you can ask how they talk to each other by bringing them to the lab and putting them uh, together you know forcing them to coagulate which they do with uh, more or less uh, ease so some of them do it very easily and form chimeric slugs and chimeric fruiting bodies some of them form chimeric slugs but then bifurcate into two fruiting bodies some of them bifurcate very early and some of them actually give you bifurcating slugs i don't know whether you can see that here so they come together but the slug itself shows segregation so there are different levels of self non self compatibility and the point of interest for us is that there are many strains which show this kind of behavior which seem to be perfectly compatible even though they are genetically different and therefore presumably have different reproductive in interests right so you can study these things when you bring them together and carry out the same kind of experiment that i mentioned earlier which is to bring a number of cells together by counting you know how many of how many cells you brought together how many of each kind and having brought these two different genotypes together you can ask what are the relative proportions in which they succeed to become reproductive succeed to become spore so this is a measure of relative fitness in this uh, kind of thing and you can get all kinds of distributions in this uh, thing so within the same strain so this is within a clonal population you can get this kind of a distribution so it's pretty much Uh, model if you wish you know with with some amount of error there between species you get a u shaped distribution which means that generally every cell in a fruiting body is either of species 1 or of species 2 very rarely you have something intermediate on the other hand between strains of the same species you get something rather interesting which is probably the same sort of average outcome but a very noisy outcome so these are things which are compatible with each other superficially they come together they build uh, they build uh, chimeric uh, slugs and chimeric aggregates and chimeric slugs and chimeric fruiting bodies but what they do after that depends on intense competition so you see there's something rather interesting going on here on the one hand uh, they seem to talk to each other and come together and build these communal structures on the other hand having come together they seem to compete with each other intensely for reproduction 
So you can see immediately that whatever explanation you have for their coming together, after coming together, uh, what happens has must have an element of reproductive fitness and relative reproductive fitness put, put into it. Okay. I'll wind up soon. Now, when you do this, and again, quantitate outcomes, you get the following result. I just illustrate one slide. The result is that the level of incompatibility in terms of their coming together or not coming together seems to have a lot of do, uh, seems to have a lot to do with uh, differences at different genetic loci. And in fact, a number of those uh, loci have been identified. But having come together, right, whether there is what's called reproductive skew, which is a high asymmetry in who contributes to sports and who doesn't contribute to sports, that doesn't seem to depend on genetic relatedness. So you can take two trains, uh, which in terms of DNA fingerprinting seem very similar to each other, but show extreme reproductive skews. You, take, you can take two other strains which seem to be very distinctly related to each other, don't share too many genes in common, but have hardly any reproductive skews. Therefore, they, they uh, in some sense, are much more friendly towards each other, you might say. So basically speaking, uh, there seems to be a D-link between genetic relatedness here and levels of cooperation. If there's a link, it's not an immediately obvious link. Right. Secondly, these same phylogenies that I told you about have shown, and I've mentioned this already, that the phylogenetic position in terms of complexity of form seems completely unrelated to phylogenetic position in terms of changes in ribosomal DNA sequence, which we think is objective. objective. Uh, so organizational complexity seems to have uh, give us no clue to phylogeny. Secondly, equally interestingly, if you look at the genomes of these amoebae, you find that a great many of the genes that they contain, which are believed to be essential for multicellularity, essential for coming together, are already found in their unicellular relatives. And when I say genes essential for multicellularity, what I mean is this. These are genes which, when mutated, don't do anything to the cell during its unicellular phase. So the cell lives as a normal cell, feeds as a normal cell, grows as a normal cell, divides as a normal cell, but is unable to become multicellular. So the assumption is that these are the genes whose evolution may have been responsible for the transition from single cells to multicells. But 80% of those genes, as you can see, are already there in other unicellular relatives, which never become multicellular. They were adding to the adding to the weight of feeling that it was not the acquisition of this, these genes that fostered multicellularity, but that multicellularity came about for whatever reason, taking advantage of the existence, existence, pre-existence of those. That many of them are also found in non amoebozoan -amoeb species. Genes, regulatory mechanisms, and morphogenetic pathways as well are shared with the so-called higher metazoa. And I have written down a list of those genes which have been published. Integrins, Wnt, Stat, uh, tyrosine kinase phosphorylation, homeobox genes, regulation by non-coding RNA. So the kinds of things that are usually believed to be essential for coordinating multicellular development in the higher plants or higher animals are found here in these organisms already. And many of these genes are present in their unicellular relatives who never become multicellular. Same kind of thing which shows again, shows an overlap between genes in Dictyostelium and genes in other, uh, other, uh, other representatives of other supergroups which are constitutively unicellular. Now, I'm coming to the close of what I want to say, which is to sum up uh, the picture that is building now and indicate what Wallwax and the Phalasterians have to say with uh, reinforcement. First of all, you can get aggregation without building a fruiting body. You get this in this related amoeba called uh, Hartmannella. You can get a fruiting body without aggregation. This is extremely interesting. This is an amoebozoid called Protostelium, which is a single cell, a single amoeba, 
and it forms this supposedly multicellular structure. Obviously, it's not a multicellular structure, but it builds a fruiting body, which means it secretes a stalk and uses negative pressure to climb up to the top of the stalk where it forms a spore. So what I call this engineering problem earlier of building the fruiting body is already present in a unicellular organism. Now there's no evidence that this protozoan, this protostelium was ancestral to the dixostelage, but this is rather interesting. You have other protozoans which are believed on the basis of molecular phylogeny to be ancestral, which sometimes show this sort of single cell fruiting body. So it appears as if the engineering problem had been solved in an ancestor, that solution clearly was not carried over into this descendant, but the capability for carrying out the solution was in some way, and that, that seems to be that seems to be embodied in this. You can get differentiation, this I've already mentioned, and uh, division of labor without cell death. So you can get a stock which is uh, acellular, uh, beg your pardon, yeah, stock which is acellular. So very quick remarks on the other two things. So the coanoflagellates, which are at the top of this picture, are the closest unicellular relatives of us, of the metazoa. So this is the closest unicellular relatives of the animal. Uh, the phylesterians are, if you wish, next closer, and then there are ichthyosporians for next closer. The picture from these three groups, especially from the phylesterians and capsospora, which uh, I mentioned a while earlier, is that uh, is that A, these so-called multicellularity genes that we spoke about a while earlier are present in them and also in their unicellular relatives. So once again, in that lineage too, you didn't need major acquisition of new genes to get multicellularity. Secondly, this is very curious, uh, which is also interesting. Many of the genes which we had believed hitherto were new to multicellular organisms turn out to have been genes who, which were lost in an ancestor and then regained later, which means the genes were there, the genes and the gene products probably were doing something else in the immediate ancestor, right? And then their original function was regained in their present day descendants. So basically, the unicellular ancestor of animals had a gene repertoire associated with differentiation and multicellular animal development. Uh, so you had the genes, you had the networks, but you didn't have multicellular development because these are obligatorily unicellular creatures that we're talking about. But again, the, the matter, the thing that I said earlier, which is that you have spatial patterns of differentiation seen now in multicellular organisms, which seem to be prefigured in these unicellular organisms in terms of temporal patterns of differentiation. So these are just a, a listing of the sorts of genes which have been found in Capsospora and uh, and Quinoflagellates. Uh, Paul Vox now. This is really a textbook example in the sense that it is used in textbooks as an illustration of how multicellularity could have evolved. And it shows a very nice series of graded complexity. And the graded complexity that is shown in books is Chlamydomonas, which is a single cell. Some of these intermediates, which are Gonium and Eudorina and Pandorina all the way up to wall box, which is probably up to a million cells, certainly 100,000 plus cells. So these are different members of the volvocalis, which show different levels of complexity, also different sizes. And the relatively uncontested assumption until recently was that in the course of evolution, you had something like dogainoflagellates, and something like gonium, something like eudorina, pludorina, and finally something like wall box. And what is also interesting, is that gonium, which is multicellular, chlamydomonas, of course, is just one cell. So there's no question of a germline soma distinction there. Everything is a somatic cell because there's only one cell, then everything becomes a germline cell. Gonium shows the same feature. All these cells keep swimming, performing somatic functions because they, they are uh, you know, swimming in uh, the search for food. So all of them keep feeding, growing. And once they have grown enough, presumably all of them become germ cells, and you can get uh, reproduction as the next step. Eudorina, which is in between, shows something interesting. And here you have an almost mathematical rule. If Eudorina consists of 32 cells or fewer, you have the same pattern as in gonium. Everyone is a somatic cell, and then everyone becomes a germ cell. 
32 being 2 to the power 5, you can see immediately that that results from 5 mitotic divisions. But 64 or more cells, you start getting spatial division of labor. Uh, so you already have within the 64 cell mass some somatic cells and some germ cells. So you have the same kind of uncanny resemblance to size dependent division of labor on the one hand and secondly temporal patterns giving way to spatial patterns once sizes increase. But the most stunning uh, piece of information that we have got out from Volvox phylogenies is that this picture of going from simple to complex completely breaks down if you look at the real, uh, real phylogeny. Well, yeah, this was supposed to be the kind of way in which the phylogeny, phylogeny worked. But it turns out now that when you do the molecular phylogenies, you find single clades which contain both the Volvox type of lifestyle plus a gonium type of lifestyle, both a gonium type of lifestyle plus a eudorina type of lifestyle. So the phylogeny in terms of traditional species names, traditional species identifications based on what they look like, right, and based on how their developmental course uh, went, that is completely muddled up, totally muddled up. Once again making the point that if your molecular phylogeny is actually showing nearest neighbor relationships in evolution and therefore genetic in some sense genetic nearness in evolution that has nothing to do with the way uh, lifestyles change, morphologies change. So grades of organizational complexity are completely different from clades of relationships. And you have other bizarre things. Uh, in fact, this is a point made by a Volvox worker and Kirk does it in this paper, which is a single mutation in Volvox carteri changes it, a single point mutation, changes it completely to a form and a lifestyle, which if you had seen it for the first time, you would have said that this is not Volvox, this is Eudorina. Remember, the single cells can't be distinguished very easily. All of them look like Chlamydomonas, no, in a sense. Uh, in a single mutation in Volvox power, C changes it so it could be called fluorina and so on and so on. So, genus and species names identify grades of organizational complexity. These are traditional names, not clades of traditional Okay, so I end here. So, the point here seems to be that genetic overlap and genetic similarity uh, are not as strong grounds for fostering groupness multicellularity in our case and as I said perhaps social behavior as one had thought of and there are uh, at least two uh, interesting examples which show that which is that even in uh, large animals you can get chimeras under the appropriate circumstance which means aggregates of different kinds of cells here the aggregates are made artificially of course this is the sheep and goat chimera and if you are lucky these creatures can go to term, they do not look very healthy but nonetheless they have gone through embryonic development completely normally and the idea is that these gross genetic differences between these two cells have not prevented the cells from talking to each other and organizing this multicellular form because whatever signals, adhesion factors and so on uh, that they needed were compatible. This is a chick quail chimera, here the uh, two again artificial aggregation followed by hatching in the lab. Uh, the divergence was even, even longer ago. So this brings up this uh, question which Stuart Newman has uh, tackled in uh, many of his papers which is that maybe, and this becomes completely speculative at this point but it is interesting speculation, maybe uh, there is a solution to the old problem of which came first the chicken or the egg and the solution is that the chicken came first, meaning the multicellular, uh, multicellular organization came first. And then secondarily, via competition for entry into the germ line, right, some of these, so this is the picture that we are looking at and have been looking at here, this one. All of these of course are the things that we know now, fertilized egg, embryo, uh, whatever, blastocyst to baby, blastula, gastula and then embryo and then adult. So the question is, could this kind of developmental strategy have given way to any one of these kinds of development strategy? And he argued that it could have because this which may have become stable in certain situations as for example in the unicellular uh, uh, organisms we have looked at may have given way to this by way of reproductive competition between the cells within the aggregate and the one which ended up 
as the winner in this competition became what you now call the egg cell. Of course, now you have to now you are suddenly confronted with this problem of sexual reproduction, which you have ignored all along, and figuring out uh, how you have this transition from uh, uh, haploid age to a diploid stage. But I want to leave you there. That's the end of my talk. Uh, basically, what I've tried to get across is that a there are organisms around now which go through a unicellular to multicellular transition as part of the normal life cycle. B, many of these organisms seem sufficiently ancient that uh, you can think they might offer you interesting clues for the origin of multicellularity. Remember, they occur in essentially all of these supergroups that we looked at. I said that they didn't occur in the archaeoplastids, but even there, it's rather interesting if you challenge Chlamydomonas with a predator, which is usually a ciliate, uh, it turns out that they gather together and form aggregates. Sathya and Durant showed this recently. Uh, so to all outward appearance, they're like one of these other creatures, except of course they are Chlamydomonas cells which have got together. They don't change in any way. Uh, but they do come together, they do aggregate. And what's interesting is that in this aggregation, they make no distinction between clone mates and otherwise. So they work with genetically heterogeneous samples, so that that plays no role. So that's the second point to show that this might offer interesting clues. And thirdly, to say that probably by looking at the broad features of coming together in pattern formation, uh, we might be able to get some clues to the origin of uh, multicellularity, rather than by trying to explain multicellularity by the acquisition of new genetic functions, which resulted in small advantages at least. Thank you. Questions? Uh, when this slug comes together, how do they decide on the axis, like where will be the uh, uh, start and end? And uh, if they move, like is it purely chemotaxis? And how like this computation, like uh, let, how do they decide where to go? Okay, there are three things there. Uh, the first question was about the axis. What was that? Uh, yeah, when they come into this mass slug, how do they decide where it will be the... Um... Right, okay. So when they come into this mass, it turns out that there's a great deal of sorting out, very similar to the sorting out that we saw earlier. And this depends on differential adhesiveness, as also on differential chemotaxis, right? which is there, inherent in the system, even if you have a clone of cells. Right? So you remember that I talked about heterogeneities prior to aggregation? These heterogeneities are correlated with differences in many of these other factors, right? Which lead immediately to sorting out. So differential adhesiveness can give you one mechanism for sorting out. Is that uh, okay or no? If different cells have different levels of sticking to each other, then they can separate. You can get a kind of phase separation. Okay. And the second thing was you said, does it move by chemotaxis? The slug does not move by chemotaxis. Chemotaxis is the process that brings cells together. As far as we know, the slug does not exhibit any chemotaxis. On the other hand, it exhibits strong phototaxis and a kind of negative geotaxis, both of which make it come to the soil surface. But where does this computation come from? Like, is there any um, like leading cells that? Sorry. Like how? Do they come to this common decision um, together? Okay. So the understanding is that after starvation, this whole series of reactions are initiated within single cells. And these reactions consist of A, acquiring gradually these adhesiveness properties, B, of making and releasing cyclic AMP, C, of developing this positive feedback mechanism which doesn't exist earlier. And these are all properties that arise in single cells individually. So they are pretty much the same in all cells except for the heterogeneities that I mentioned. And that's enough to make them come together. Um, the oscillation comes about because of an interesting combination of positive and negative feedback. The positive feedback is that cyclic AMP outside the cell can bind to the receptor and trigger more cyclic AMP synthesis. 
There are two negative feedbacks that are rather interesting. The simpler uh, one to understand is uh, there are phosphodiesterases which are induced by cyclic AMP, right? So when the cyclic AMP level gets very high, the enzyme activity, activity gets very high and the cyclic AMP level crashes down. But the more interesting kind of neg negative feedback comes about because of receptor desensitization. So the receptors binding to cyclic AMP crosses a threshold, we think. We don't know whether it's a clear threshold. Then it turns out that the positive feedback loop is cut. Right? And the cyclic AMP degrades again because of enzyme. Of course, it's also diffusing away. So the cyclic AMP is sent by one cell does two things. It signals to other cells to come to it. It signals to itself to set up this feedback loop, which initiate oscillations, and presumably also triggers other cells to get into the oscillatory path. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. First is for dictyostelium. When the cells start starving, uh, each of them is secreting cyclic AMP. So where do they decide to finally aggregate to wherever the highest concentration of cyclic AMP is? Yes, which in turn means wherever you have a locally high fluctuation of the concentration of cells. Okay. And in case of Chlamydomonas, when they're challenged with, say, a predator, uh, and they just aggregate and don't do anything differently, I'm wondering what the advantage of aggregation oh, in this case is. Sorry, I mentioned that. Move far. The ciliate can't, uh, can't swallow them anymore. Oh. They're too big. Oh. I see. Exactly. So they survive. Uh, I see. And also, um, the point mutation that could uh, change Volvox into something like the unicellular. Not change, really. You know what I mean. If you hadn't known that that had happened, and you were chancing upon this for the first time, right? Uh, you would call it uh, Eudorina, something or the other. But is it known what mutation it is? Yes, yes. I, unfortunately, not known to me at this moment, but I can look it up and uh, yes. Thank you. By the way, there's an amusing thing related to that, which is there was a massive uh, collection of natural isolates uh, of you know many of these many of these species made uh, in Australia, if I remember correctly. And this was in particular a hunt for Pudorina. So you went by traditional taxonomic criteria and identified the number of them. Later, when molecular sequencing was done, it turned out that these were all uh, misnomers. One of the Pudorinas was really a wall wax. The other one was really some, you know, gonium, other was something. So there's this whole big debate now, certainly in microbial uh, taxonomy, about what to do with these old names that we have. And that's as true with uh, Dictyostelium as with the others. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, this side. Yeah. So, uh, my question is maybe uh, something uh, different from what you talk, but uh, in similar lines is uh, the symbiotic uh, association, right? As in, we know that uh, e eukaryotic cell evolved from a prokaryote after engulfing other cells, right? So uh, you talked about uh, temporal differentiation where cells together perform one type of work than another type of work. But uh, uh, a model wherein they uh, do, uh, do different organism cooperate, right? So, but such kind of model which uh, which I I didn't um, the I uh, I was uh, uh, so I wanted to know some work on those lines wherein uh, organism developed after the symbiotic association and uh, which will be completely different model compared to the other model that you suggested. Oh, hang on. So within the theme of multicellularity, Multi multicellular. what you're saying is that multicellularity could be maybe an obligatory byproduct of symbiosis. Yeah. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? Well, in a way that happens in some cases, you know, for example, in, um, uh, in, uh, some of these phylasterians, it turns out that this aggregation, which I've been talking about, please remember the situations which I described in detail had to do with uh, these amoeboid organisms which came together, built fruiting bodies with or without division of labor. 
and you find these in at least six of the seven supergroups. So that, that's the situation that I looked at. Uh, I also mentioned that you get multicellular aggregations, I beg your pardon, multicellular structures formed in the phylesterians, in ichthyosporians, in uh, capsospora, and so on, right? In the coanoflagellates, I beg your pardon, and so on. Now, there it turns out that the route to multicellularity need not be starvation. So, quite often, these coanoflagellates, which feed on bacteria, gather together where there are a lot of bacteria. So, in some sense, it's a food induced coming together, and then they form this multicellular mass. So, now I don't know whether you want to call it. That food is not complementary, right? As exactly. It's exactly. So I was going to say. Uh, and complementary things. So, what make them come together? People who, people who work on bird flocks, which is a form of multicellularity, uh, and many cases this can also involve multi species flocks. So, these birds flock onto fruit yielding, fruit bearing trees. And there you can see the symbiosis uh, in the But they are quite similar organism which is coming. Pardon? In bird flock, uh, similar the, kind so of birds. Birds of different species, even multi-species, they can flock on a given tree. I'm not saying that they are collaborating. Okay. But this flocking helps the bird, because you only find the roosting place, and by having large numbers of birds in one place, you get a better, better risk of predator avoidance. And the fruits have the usual obvious benefit. They eat the fruit and deposit the seeds somewhere and so on. I guess there should be some, uh, like if organism is very big, right, they won't symbiote easily. If organism is at the, like, multicellular level where, you, where they are like 10 cells, 20 cells. Or no, you get, you get cells. symbiotic associations between large organisms as well. Okay. Right in the just like human do have, yeah, true. Hello, yeah. So when we see the uh, slug part, and there is this special differentiation between prestalk cells and and prestalk, pres so uh, um, so it seems like the differentiation was before the slug. Uh, motion and that the differentiation could be like for differential cell migration or uh, stuff like that. So I would like to know if there is some work about how does this initial differentiation occurs if there is a special pattern like for example pre stock cells being in the center of the amoeba aggregation or something related more to space in the beginning. So. That's really an interesting point. Uh, the general belief is that there is no such relationship but there are some experimental findings which badly need to be repeated. Uh, Sorry, what? Some experimental findings which need to be reconfirmed, uh, but they're rather interesting. So, for example, there's one uh, set of findings which says that the cells which begin to signal initiate the process ultimately become spores. That would be <coughs> rather nice if that was true. Oh, yeah. I guess I'm rather surprised that you haven't said anything about quorum sensing because, well, before this talk, I would have thought that the difference between multicellular and unicellular things is the aggregation. But given the talk from yesterday and yours, it seems that aggregation is just a thing that cells do in the same way that unicellular organisms quorum sense. So it, is it that we, like, we're just calling things unicellular that that aren't so uni like they're they're coordinating among themselves but they might not be like physically attached is that yeah no, i mean i'll go along with that yeah so you sh you showed some uh, spiral waves the cm oscillations so that is a, a the pseudo color plot was a cm concentration Sorry? Uh, CM concentrate, the pseudo color plot you showed was a CM concentration. And the center of the spiral wave, is that a single cell which is giving out the signal or is it? Uh... Okay. That's a very interesting question. Perhaps you could discuss it later in detail. But the center of a spiral wave can also be a hole. Yeah, it's singularity. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So towards the end of your talk, you're alluding to uh, camerism. Uh, and you're giving two examples of uh, artificial camera that were generated in uh, in animals. So uh, 
my my question was or more comment. I, I wanted you to uh, uh, extend a bit or comment a bit on the fact that uh, you're showing these two examples that are artificial, but we know that this situation is not that rare and is in in natural organisms, uh, in natural in animals in particular. You want to comment on this? Well, briefly, maybe you can comment more. I'll tell you the two cases which come to mind uh, right away. Acidians do this a lot of the time. They show, show fusion, so you can even get uh, adults fusing with each other and developing chimeras. And the very nice work being done, uh, having been done, and is being done, I think, by Rinkevich, and you first uh, pointed it out to me, uh, which looks at uh, competition for entry into the germ line after chimera formation in acidians. And yesterday, of course, uh, Stuart showed us uh, this uh, remarkable finding in planarians, which seem to be quite often obligatory chimeras. Uh, any other cases you know? Yeah, so that's two examples, uh, into, including the example that Stuart presented yesterday that I didn't know about. Uh, it's actually a situation that is also observed in, uh, in mammalian species, including in humans. And in, uh, I just showed uh, to Zorana an example of a paper from 1979 in Nature, uh, where so it was the very beginning of uh, genotyping at the, at the time. And uh, there was a case of a, of a mother who was genotyped and also uh, for her children. Obviously, it should all match. Right. You're right. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was no matching between any of the four children and the mother, which is very, very, very surprising. Of course, the random exchange of the four children on four separate occasions at the maternity was also excluded. And the explanation is the mother is a, is a camera, and there is no symptom. It's, there is no disease associated to this situation. Uh, it was found just completely by chance. And the explanation is this person is a camera and the cells that were used for genotyping are coming from her blood. And of course, the cells that gave rise to her children are not from her blood. And this is the explanation. So cameras are probably much more frequent than we think, uh, even in the uh, marine species. That's right. all. Thanks for pointing that out. I believe that there are many other uh, cases which um, human geneticists have come across uh, where you get things like double fertilization, you know, followed by chimeric development, in other words, Simultaneous ovulation of two uh, eggs, both of which get fertilized, and then the zygotes join up together. And apparently, there are examples of that as well. Mm, you have told us about how multicellularity can be like defined in one fruiting body, but have you seen like? a more like the interaction between fruiting bodies and maybe giving us some kind of ideas about, I don't know, like multicellularity can be explained studying one fruiting body, but it can be explained also if you see the, the groups of, or one group of many fruiting bodies? I, I don't know. It's That's a very interesting question. I, I was just thinking of something while you were saying this. To begin with, I don't know how to answer that question because I don't know if well, there's one well-known interaction between fruiting bodies uh, which results to spacing. So it turns out that while fruiting, uh, these, uh, at least the slime molds that have been worked on most frequently, they release ammonia. And ammonia is a repellent gas. So the fruiting bodies make sure that they stay away from each other while fruiting. So that, that's one kind of interaction. But what that has to do with multicellularity per se, I'm not sure. And whether there are other interactions, I don't know. Uh, there's something else which might interest you. I don't know whether this is uh, in line with your question. This is a long uh, unsolved problem in some sense. There are speculations, but I think we still haven't got our hands on it. The problem is the following. If you plate these cells on a, you know, on a petri dish in the lab, uh, you get, a, and finally you get fruiting bodies, you get a certain density of fruiting bodies. Right? Now that density turns out to be pretty much invariant over a huge range of cell densities. In other words, uh, the more cells there are, the larger any given fruiting body is, but that doesn't mean a larger number of fruiting bodies in a given area. You get the same number as before with the same spacing as before. So the territory size, if you wish, 
an aggregate seems rather insensitive to the number of cells who are in the aggregate. That, that's rather, it, it's almost as if you know you had cities or villages decided initially and whatever the number of people there were divided themselves among those villages to the fixed space. Here. So it's not known how that's done, but presumably that also involves some form of interaction. I don't know. So uh, they, can you hear me? Yeah. So when they become uh, like when we starve them, they come together as aggregates, right? So when is the decision final? Like if we give the food back to them, when will they like will they again become single cells? Like till what stage they can revert? Back? Very true. Someone said once long ago, uh, these cells never die until they're really dead, which means all the way up to the very end until terminal differentiation occurs, you can give them food and they go back. Uh, so is there any way that we can track if same cells um, become the stock or spores every time? Very interesting question. Okay. <clears throat> Here's a finding. Um, Yama, you remember who did this together with Takeuchi? I forget the... Yeah, someone and Takeuchi did this experiment. So you had these cells come together, form stock and spore, Right uh, now, there are tricks by which you can get amoebae to come out of the spores, even though there is no food. And one of those tricks is heat shocking. So you can get amoebae. Of course, there is a fixed number; they don't grow or divide anymore. You can get amoebae which have gone through a life cycle and have become amoebae of the next generation in the absence of food. So, if you take amoebae which have come in this way from spores. And you take other amoebae, which have not come from stocks because the stocks are dead, but which you generate from the stock cells in this kind of way by disaggregating them. And then you mix them. Turns out that the ones which came from spores form spores again. Follow? And the ones which came from stocks form stocks. So there's some form of epigenetic, uh, just to use the word inheritance here, but its basis is not known. This pattern breaks down if you allow them to feed in between and go through mitosis, then everyone forgets what their background was. So let's thank Dr. Nanjulia for the insightful talk. And thank you.